I had my annual physical every August this year. It was conducted by a new doctor. My old doctor retired. The new doctor was a young woman, Marion Wellner. She is red-haired, in her early 30s. I didn't really want her to do the examination. Part of it was the intimate physical contact and I thought about embarrassment. Dr. Wilner's nurse, he did many preliminary procedures, such as taking blood pressure, an ECG, and testing my ability to remember. A book, an apple, a table. After a few minutes I was always worried about this. But this time I was worried about being practically naked in front of a young woman. An attractive young woman. But I didn't need to worry. I was so nervous that there was no chance of arousal. When we finished with this part, she smiled and said, Well, I'm sure you're glad it's all over. Yes, glad. Thank you. I smiled back at her. The remainder of the examination was routine. The blood work was excellent and everything checked out. When we were about to leave, she asked, Do you have three children? Yes, two boys and a girl. Have you adopted a child? No. Eco. But why are you asking? She blushed. Well, I'm new and I looked through all your notes before this meeting about you. Well, it doesn't matter. Thank you for being so quick. She waved her hands. You must explain yourself, doctor. This is my body. Mr. Miller, you have a disease. You have been infertile since birth. Mr. Miller, is Ted Miller about? Nobody told you about this? No. Please make copies of all my medical records. Now. I was as shocked as can be. Certainly. Sorry. I should have remained silent. No, not at all. Apparently too many people were silent. About 30 minutes later I received the notes. Meanwhile, I was thinking about this. I'm 48. I've been married 26 years to Melissa. We have three children. Brad, 24 years old, Mary, 22 years old, and William, 20 years old. At least I thought we had three children. Brad is married with a son on the way. Mary has just graduated from college and William is a junior. I wondered who their real father was. But after thinking about it, I found that I was not convinced by D.R. Wilner's words. All three looked like me. Partly. When the notes arrived, I took them to my office and scanned them. I considered various possibilities. To verify what she told me, I called a college friend of mine who was a doctor in New York. He called me back an hour later. This is Mark Madden, urologist. Close enough, I said. Hi, Mark. I need some advice, but without personal appearance and strict confidentiality is required. Tell me about it. I told you. Send me the notes by email and I'll look at them this afternoon. Done. And please send the bill. The service is done quickly. He called back at 330. Ted, at birth, you had a disease that led to infertility. I'm guessing you didn't do anything about it. I didn't know about this. Well, then, when you were born and you were diagnosed, nothing could be done. Over the past 10 years, we have developed a method of helping. Can you send me a textbook on this subject, Mark? Certainly. I'll send you an email in 10 minutes. Good luck. Thank you. Hey, Ted, don't you have kids? Eat well. That's what I thought. Oh. Oh, I see. Good luck. I hung up and called the DNA lab. I agreed that they would send me several sets on the same day. They arrived at 5 o'clock. I put them in my briefcase and went home. My youngest, William, was still at school and was due to leave next week. 
After some thought, I decided that it was enough to test one of the children. When I arrived, Will was at home, reading in the living room. Melissa was cooking. She usually returns early from work selling real estate through an agency owned by my older brother, Robert. I smelled fish. Her cooking, that is. The three of us ate crusty cod and salad. Good food. I think Mel noticed my reticence, but Will probably didn't. Mel is also 48. She hasn't gained a pound since college, where we met. She has dark brown hair and eyes like mine. Her height is 1 meter and 70. Her weight is 59 kilograms. She is quite pretty. While Mel and I were cleaning up, I picked up the glass that Will had used at dinner. Later, I took it upstairs and cleaned the rim with a swab I had. Then I went into Will's room and took a few hairs from his brush. And I swabbed the neckline of a t-shirt in his dirty clothes basket. And also his sneakers. I also took a swab from the inside of my cheek, sealed everything in envelopes, and put them in a briefcase. That evening, Will left. And when he left, Mel asked me, What's happening to you, Ted? You're lethargic. Passed a medical examination. Something happened? No. Healthy as always. He was probably nervous about the new doctor. How is she? Good. Pretty. I was nervous, you know, she laughed. Her laugh is contagious. You haven't gotten up? No. I was too nervous about this. Well, I'll see her next week and I'll ask just to check to her. I left that evening. She wanted sex and I told her that I didn't really want it. She accepted it with dignity. The fact that I refused her was unusual. The next day I took the DNA samples to the laboratory myself. I paid for a quick analysis. They told me they would have something by Friday. Two days later I went to work. I work as a lawyer at an investment bank. Essentially, I manage an in-house team of six other lawyers. We are located in Washington, close to regulatory authorities. I have been doing this work for 22 years and I earn very well. I also have stock options that, if cashed out, would be worth a pretty penny. I admit that I was distracted at work. However, what needed to be done was done. I rode my bike to work and rode my bike back. The exercise, I thought, would calm me down. When I arrived at 6, Mel was not at home. She left a note saying there were sandwiches and salad in the refrigerator. She was going to a play and then perhaps a bachelorette party. Normally, I wouldn't think much of it. She did both with some regularity. But now there is no trust. I ran the location finder on her phone. She wasn't in a nightclub. She was at a motel near the Fairfax line. I ate and talked a little with Will about college. He was looking forward to this. The summer went well for him. He worked in a bicycle repair shop and earned decent money. But he broke up with his girlfriend, Lisa, and was a little depressed. I went to bed early. Mel arrived at 11 and was in bed soon after. No shower, but she pulled away a little when I tried to press against her. I did this to see her reaction. I knew she was cheating. I just didn't know with whom. And he had no intention of trying to have sex with her. The next day I got up early and rode my bike to work again. There I took a shower and immediately got to work. It was a busy morning. At one o'clock I received a call from the DNA laboratory. They emailed me the report. But on the phone the technician said that Will's samples belonged to my nephew. I almost fainted. I have only one brother, Robert. He is three years older than me. He helped me throughout my childhood. He and I were about the same height, 180 meters, and average build. He was a good athlete at school and played basketball at university. He was not a star, but he played. He finished school and started selling real estate. 
he succeeded in this and opened his own company. He married Glenn Wilson, his college sweetheart, and they had three children. All three had graduated from college and were working. About four years ago, Melissa joined his firm. Before that she worked as a teacher. I made good money and she didn't have to work. But what was already old enough to take care of himself after school. And she wanted something more interesting. At least that's what she said now. I absolutely did not believe anything she said. After receiving the news about DNA, I sat and wondered what could have happened. All three of my children had birthdays at the end of September. The countdown I got was around Christmas, when Mel and I decided to have children. She stopped taking birth control pills. We tried for months before last Christmas, before Brad came along at Christmas, there was a big family gathering, as usual. And Rob was there with his family. And I remembered that after Christmas that year and many subsequent years, Mel and her friend Linda Green went on a week-long meditation retreat. They left on Boxing Day, the second day of Christmas, and returned on New Year's Day. Some years they stayed an extra week. The seminar was supposed to take place at one of the centers in the mountains of West Virginia. When Brad showed up, Mel didn't go the next year. But I went again the next time. Mary appeared the following September. There was no workshop when Mary was breastfeeding. But when she was 15 months old, Mel and Linda went again. Will arrived the following September. The traveling seminars continued for several years. I thought about it. They stopped when Mel went to work for Rob. Linda Green had been Mel's best friend since college. She got a job at Rob's new company when he opened it. So the three of them worked together, and that was the case for a while. The next weekend, we took Will back to college. I rented a minibus, and we had a nice two-hour drive on Saturday, had lunch with Will and helped him move into the apartment he shared with his good friend Mike Watson. After that, Mel and I waved goodbye to them and left. I admit, when we were alone, I behaved quietly. Eventually, Mel noticed it. She said, What? You didn't even say two words to me. She looked worried. I have a lot to worry about, Mel. So many. This is not what I'm going to discuss now. So secret. Ted, you're not lying about the physical exam, are you? No. Leave it alone, Mel. This is my best advice at the moment. For the rest of the trip, about an hour, we talked about almost nothing. I dropped her off and returned to the van. After which he went to a local bar and drank beer. I thought about it some more. I couldn't understand how Mel had undergone any medical procedure to get pregnant with Rob's child. This meant only one thing. They had sex repeatedly and for many years. Perhaps it was Rob that Mel met at the motel. Sitting at the bar, I was angrier than ever. You know what they say about the red color in the eyes. It seemed to me that this was so. Everything I looked at had a strange hue. I scared the bar manager, a young woman. In the end, he threw a ten on the counter and left. I had several friends with whom I played cards and tennis. My closest friend was Ned Bart. I went to his house. She and Mel never got along. His wife, Sadie, was not close to Mel at all. Their children also left for college. So when I rang the bell, Sadie answered. Ned was nearby. They immediately saw that I was out of shape. Ned has a small gym in his backyard garage. I said, I need to use calm. Ned. Ned and I practiced self-defense at a small gym near our house. I knew he had a bag because I worked with him once a week. Certainly. He and I went out into the backyard. I put on gloves and attacked his heavy bag as if my life depended on its bursting. Ned watched silently. After the initial frenzy, I began to act more systematically. I kept hitting and hitting until I fell. Ned picked me up and helped me walk to his house. 
I fell onto a lounge chair on his terrace. Sadie brought me some water. Having come to my senses a little, I began to sob. Ned asked, is someone dead or injured? No, not yet. My son turned into a growl. These two were smart enough to leave me alone. Ten minutes later, Ned brought the beer. Sadie sat down next to me. She said, now that you've done all this, you have to tell us. I made them promise to remain silent and told them everything. Both were shocked. Ned said, how? I mean, without telling you. And your parents should have known. I thought about it. The medical record when I was a child laid out everything about the condition they knew. Sadie asked, what are you going to do? I have no idea. Don't take it to heart. Please. Don't lose it like you did with the bag. Prison is not a good place. I won't. I think I'd better go home. She'll be worried, and I want to avoid confrontation for now. I drove back to my house. Mel stood at the door. Where have you been? I worried so much, stopped for a beer, and met Ned. I went to his house to do some work carrying sacks. Sorry, I should have called. I got in the shower and we had dinner. On Sunday, we went for a picnic to a locale park and went rollerblading. But we didn't have sex on any of the nights on Sunday. Mel looked disappointed and confused. I got up early and left for work without whacking her. I made an appointment with a lawyer in a nearby building and went to our bank. I also visited my company's HR department to change the direct deposit and beneficiary of my retirement account. This was not easy. A lawyer let me know about a divorce in our state. But she, Millie Stanton, also said that my wife and brother cheated on me. Maybe this will be useful to me. I asked her to file a divorce petition with alternative grounds. But don't let her give it to Mel until I give the go-ahead. That evening, I installed tracking software on Mel's cell phone. She was on my phone plan, and I could receive her messages and the numbers she called. I also threw three small voice recorders into my house. In the kitchen, bedroom, and living room. One went into her car. I asked Mel to set up a party at my house with Rob and Glenda on Friday night. On Monday and Tuesday, I stayed late at work telling Mel that I had something important to take care of. On Wednesday, I returned home on time. We had a nice dinner, and I put on a good face. But there was no sex. Mel was clearly disappointed. Later, I downloaded all the materials from the recorders and checked her phone. When Mel went to bed, I listened. There weren't many entries during the day. No one was home. And Mel didn't talk to herself. She made one call to Rob's cell phone and one to my mom. Five years earlier, my mother was widowed. She was 78 and lived 30 minutes from where I grew up. The bell rang. First I heard Mel's voice. Mom, have you heard anything about Tim lately? Well, he seems to be out of his mind. He had a physical and hasn't been himself ever since. Don't know. Just checking. Okay. The next call was to Rob. Rob, this is Mel. No, we can't do it this week. You guys will arrive on Friday. And Tim is acting strange. Don't know. I don't see any chance of him finding out anything. Look, we're being careful. And either way, I think he got some bad news from the physical. Okay. See you, baby. The essence of this conversation was the actual end of my marriage. They are still together. It occurred to me that at first they might have thought they were doing me a favor. But in reality, no matter what they think, I'm going to punish them as best I can. Rob and Glenda arrived at 630. On Friday, Mel and I made food. Grilled hamburgers and fries. Sat ballad while we were doing this, I studiously ignored Mel. She noticed this, but didn't say anything. 
When the doorbell rang, she looked at me and said, I hope, Tim, you're not going to be in a bad mood oliving. Do the same, but I turned away. I bought them drinks. Beer for Rob, white wine for Glenda. We sat on the terrace, I didn't say anything and opened the door. Rob and Glenda greeted me. Glenda hugged me. Rob tried to, all four of us. I said, I'm divorcing you, Mel. On Monday, you will be served with a divorce petition. Rob, I'm suing you for child support for all the years I raised and paid for your children. Mel began to sob. Rob jumped up and stood over me. You are an idiot. Jerk. I'll kill you now. Glenda watched. Rob tried to hit me while I was sitting on a chair on the porch. I stumbled back away from him and turned over in my chair. And then he stood up and said, Are you angry? You are a hypocritical asshole. Let's. Let's do it. He growled and attacked me. Swinging. I ducked under his fist and punched him in the gut. He wasn't as strong as me. The blow took his breath away. Doesn't matter. I hit him in the stomach again. I didn't hear Mel scream. I continued to hit Rob until he fell onto my shoulder. Then I kneed him in the groin and threw him onto the terrace. I turned around. Glenda stood up, but looked only at Mel, who rushed to Rob. He was conscious and moaning. Mel looked up at me. You had no reason to hurt Rob. None. You are a savage. You could have killed him. She was still sobbing. And I still can. And you're not safe either. You're a sneaky bitch. Mel turned white at my threat. She slowly backed away from Rob. I growled at her, pick up this piece of shit and get him out of my sight. You only have a minute before I finish him off completely. Mel tried to pick Rob up. She found it difficult to cope with his dead weight. She looked at Glenda and said, Help me with him, Glenda. Glenda came to her senses a little. She simply said, No. You two are on your own. I agree that you are a bitch. Mel pulled Rob onto the couch on the patio. She picked him up and staggering, disappeared into the kitchen. I looked at Glenda. So you didn't know? No. No. I've had some suspicions about Rob over the years, but not with Mel. I think they are still together. Maybe she has sex with other guys. I don't know. I heard the garage door go up. I walked inside and looked out the front door. Mel put Rob in the passenger seat of her SUV and drove away. Glenda came inside. This is a pleasant looking woman. Blonde, 46 years old. She was well dressed for the dinner party. But she was crying and her makeup didn't look very good. I looked at her. More wine? No. Can't you explain all this to me? I did it. She was sitting at the kitchen table. When I got to the after Christmas workshops, Glenda said, Rob always went on winter ski trips. I hate skiing and stayed home with Mark. Mark was her son. I said, I wonder where they really went. Who cares? This is all too much for me. Sorry, Glenda. I thought you knew. Are you getting a divorce for Rayal? Certainly. Never doubted it. I told Glenda she could stay overnight in the guest room. She agreed. Then we started talking about the past. About when and where Rob and Mel might meet. Now I showed her the recording of Mel's call to Rob. She left no doubt that their romance continues to this day. At 10 o'clock we ate hamburgers. We talked a little more about practical things, like where we would all live. I had a waiting list for an apartment near my work. I assumed that Mel and I would split the money including the proceeds from the house. For now, I'll stay here. Glenda decided to go upstairs and go to bed. 
I followed her to see how the guest room was doing. She was ready. I brought her a towel and a toothbrush. When he left, she said, I've always liked you, Tim. I never liked Mel. She thought I was on some lower level. I think now I know why. I waved to her and closed the door. The next morning, I was already on my feet. The police didn't come for me. I guess that neither Rob nor Mel wanted publicity. I asked Linda what she was going to do. She said she would go to her mother until Rob vacated their house. I gave her my lawyer's email address and told her to contact her for clarification. Her car was still there. I asked if she would like me to accompany her to pick up more of her things. She agreed. Then I took a pistol out of my gun safe and followed her car to their house. Mel's car was not there. Glenda and I went inside. There was no one there. It started to think how badly I had hurt this asshole. He hoped that he was admitted to some low-grade hospital where he would contract an infection caused by the bacterium Clostridium difficile and die of dehydration or something like that. Glenda sat down. She said, I wonder where they are. Let me check. I started the phone locator again. I wondered why Mel didn't notice this the first time. This time, her phone was at Cambria Hospital. I called the hospital and asked if Rob was there. They told me that he had arrived. I reported this to Glenda. She decided to stay at her home and change the locks. So I went to Home Depot and bought a bunch of new hardware. Some for her, some for me. I spent the morning installing it. I gave her the keys and left her there. But I felt sorry for her and I said that I would like to return. She agreed. She said she would cook. I finished changing the locks on my house and made extra keys for me and Glenda. I returned home to her at 4 o'clock. When I entered the house, they called me on my mobile phone. It was Detective William James. He wanted to talk to me. I said, I'm at 204 Western Street. Mrs. Glenda Miller is here too. Is she the second witness? The victim's wife? He wasn't a victim, detective. And, yes, that's her. Will you come? I can be there in 15 minutes. He was an African-American man with a fair complexion, short and broad. He was wearing a nice suit and expensive moccasins. Glenda let him in the front door and he introduced himself. Then he asked, are you too comfortable? She answered, no. It is our spouses who cheat on us, not us. Then she looked at me. For now, she said it evenly, as if it was supposed to happen. James stared at her, then at me. He said, maybe you'll get lucky, boy. I answered, maybe. I looked at Glenda. She didn't look away. I thought that this was not the best approach to a police interrogation. James said, I'd like to talk to Mrs. Miller first. Glenda took him back to the back patio and I saw him turn on the recorder on his phone. They talked for almost 20 minutes. Glenda then walked into the house and waved for me to go out onto the patio. As she passed by, she whispered, I mean, this. Her open offer was a real red herring. I always liked her and liked her looks, but I wasn't the type to play pranks. But still... The detective said he was recording and asked me to tell him what happened. I started by finding out that my children were actually Rob's and that I only found out recently. Described dinner on Friday and his reaction. He also described our quarrel. I was as accurate as possible. When I finished, he asked, how did you know this? I do not want to discuss it. Suffice it to say that no one snitched on me. Everything happened by chance. Fine. Well, Mr. Miller, your testimony is quite consistent with the testimony of the wives. I haven't questioned your brother yet. Why? 
because after I talked to your wife, it seemed to me that he was the aggressor. And you responded. And he's not in very good shape right now. He will have to stay a day or so to get tested. I asked. Tests? He looked at me intently. This is not a joke at all. A knee to the groin is the only thing that can cause you trouble. But then he turned away and smiled. What will happen now? I'll write this down and send it to the Commonwealth's attorney. She will make a decision. I'll talk to your brother. Detective James stood up and I walked him into the house where Glenda joined us as we walked to the front door. Coming out of the entrance, he turned and looked at us. I hope you two have a good evening. Then he walked to his car. Glenda closed the door. She stood right in front of me, raised her head up and slightly to the side. She said, dinner. A heavy salad in the refrigerator. There's no rush. She said this in a voice that left no doubt about what she wanted from me. I don't know how women do it. I kissed her. It was an open invitation and I saw no reason to refuse. She dug into me and our kisses carried us to the sofa. She pulled me towards her. She was furious and I responded to her having undressed. I stood over her. She pulled off her dress. Later, I thought that she planned everything and dressed for seduction. It definitely worked. It wasn't sex for love. It was pure lust. I brought her to several climaxes. Then I could no longer hold back and came to the finish line in the same way. I rolled off of her and she slowly stood up. She took my hand and led me to the kitchen. We had dinner and went upstairs. She said, I know that what we are doing is perhaps something like restoration, but I don't mind. Me too. We had sex. A shower. Sex again. We changed positions to satisfy each other and came to climax more than once. Finally, our middle-aged bodies began to crave sleep. And we got it. I woke up first. I was in the master bedroom shower when she walked in on me. This led to another fight. We soaked each other, washed everything and wiped it dry. Then they brought each other to the finish line again. Then we took a shower again and we had breakfast. It was Sunday. We both wondered what was going on with our spouses. But neither of us were church people. I checked the location of Mel's phone. She was at my mother's house. It just reminded me that I should talk to my mother who probably played some role in my cuckolding. I talked to Glenda about this. She said, I'm actually not sure about any of this. You know, how it happened. Maybe it doesn't matter. It matters to me if my mother has something to do with this. And I also need to talk to Mel. Maybe she came home and couldn't get in. But she made no effort to see me or communicate. They are probably sorting things out. I'm heading there. Do you want to come with me? I always want to. I am a born slut. You tore my hat off. She laughed. So will you go with me to mom? Yes, why not? We can make it obvious what we have done. Yes. What good is revenge sex if the cheaters don't know about it? We both laughed. We arrived at the house of my mother, Shirley Miller. Mel's car was there. Glenda and I walked out onto the porch, and Mom opened the door. Go away, Tim. You hurt Rob. Rob needed to be hurt anyway. He tried to hit me. I'm here to find out how involved you are in this. If I turn around and leave, I won't come back. Ever. She let me in. Glenda followed me. Mel was sitting in the kitchen. She saw me, and then Glenda and I immediately understood everything. She said, Oh, you bitch. Didn't wait, huh? No. Why should I wait? Your boyfriend won't be able to please me anymore. But your husband definitely can. Mel quickly stood up, but I dragged her away. 
My mother shouted for us to stop. She looked at me and said, Tim, you probably ruined everything when you went with Glenda. No. Now I'm a free agent and so is she. I think it's always been that way for Mel and Rob. Glenda and I have a lot of catching up to do, and we had a good start. Mel said, you must listen to me and your mother. We can bring things to light and perhaps heal. Tim looked back and forth between his wife and mother. I'm listening. Shirley looked at Mel and Mel said, we wanted children, you and me. But when they started trying, your mother said that you were sterile. No children you did not know, Shirley said, but I had a solution. Rob. Rob could have gotten Mel pregnant, and you would never have known, I said. And you decided all this without telling me? Shirley replied, your father wanted to discuss this with all of us, but was rejected. The votes were three to one. Yes, two traitors and you against your father. We looked at various methods. Medical, all of them were too expensive and labor-intensive. And you should have known that you were raising Rob's children, Mel said. So we reluctantly decided to do it naturally, I said, and you lied, snuck out and had sex for a week. Once for two weeks. And you had a great time, right, Mel? She looked down and said, once we got over the initial hesitancy, I really had a great time. I won't lie about that. And everything worked. I said it worked all three times. And you looked forward to your time with Rob? Mel said, yes, I was waiting he is a good man. Glenda said, is it true? What about me, bitch? He lied and mocked me, Shirley said. We decided that you might disagree. Glenda frowned. You were absolutely right. I wouldn't agree then, and I don't agree now. You were the reason, at least for my divorce. I bet Tim does too. Mel said, Nobody needs to get a divorce. Neither of you knew anything, and until now you both were happy. What's happened, Ed? My medical examination, the doctor told me that I was infertile from birth. I took DNA from William. Mel lowered her eyes. Now you know everything, Tim. We can get through this. You love these kids. Do you love me? I said. But Mel, you two kept cheating on us after three children. You continued to do this until you went to work at his company. And I bet you never stopped. Glenda growled. Well, what, bitch? How many times have you and Rob had sex in the last year? Shirley stared at Mel. Chalk, please tell me it's not true, Chalk. We fell in love. We were compatible. In and out of bed. So we continued to meet. I said, yeah, like last week at the Shady Pines Motel. Mel looked shocked. Have you hired a detective? I just launched the locator on your phone, Mel said. We can stop. We'll stop. I only need you, Tim, Glenda said. I want him too. You can leave with your great love interest. There's no turning back. Shirley, who was standing, sat down abruptly on the kitchen chair. She didn't look well. I asked, Mom, are you okay? She began to cry. What have I done? My God, Glenda said. Secrets and lies only lead to more secrets and lies. You should have told Tim from the beginning, Mel said. Then none of our children would exist. So maybe what Shirley did wasn't so bad. I looked at Mel. You're missing the point, Mel. You, Rob, and my mother schemed, plotted, and betrayed me. Looking back, my life seems like a big false facade. You stole my life from me. My whole life has been a lie. I sat down too. I was filled with deep sadness. Mel stepped towards me. I pushed her away. I sobbed. Never again, Mel. Never again. 
Glenda hugged me from behind. We all cried. Finally I stood up and Glenda and I walked away from the others. Nobody followed us. When we returned to her house, we were not in the mood. I helped her weed the garden and mow the lawn. We had lunch. After that, they started talking. I asked Glenda, are you sure about the divorce? After all, you and Rob were together. Glenda replied, well, remember what you said about them taking your life? I feel the same way. I'll go see your lawyer tomorrow. We can go together. But I don't see any way back. It was too long and too angry. I said, this is what I believe in. I have to think about the children. Perhaps if there is a divorce, they should know. Why? How should I tell them? Call them or write a letter and ask them to call. So I did. After lunch, I wrote a letter to my three children. The gist of the letter, after I laid out the facts, was that they will always be my children to me. They will always be the ones I raised and loved. I sent an email and asked them all to call. My cell phone rang a little over an hour later. It was my daughter, Mary. She asked Dad, Are you okay, Will? And how are you? It's very hard to go through. I just know that I love you and you are my dad forever. I can't figure out what to do with my mom. She and Grandma. How could they? Grandma thought she was doing me a favor. I didn't know that the two of them would be forever. Your mother. I will never forgive her. Never. What you do depends only on you. I won't know what to do for a while. Well, in many ways, I hope that you will come to some kind of semi-friendly solution. I guess I hope so. Yes. Not easy. Well, I just wanted to talk to you. I love you. I love you, too. We hung up. Brad called two minutes later and we had a similar conversation. William called at 11. When he read the letter, he was a little more reserved than the other two. He said I. When I was at home and everyone else went to school, I saw something about mom. I ignored it, but I had to talk to someone about it. Sorry, dad. There is no reason to mope. Everything is over. You were in a difficult situation and did not know about all this. We ended our conversation after a few minutes. Will didn't speak very well. He was close to his mother. At least it was. I wondered how much he really knew about her and Rob. Glenda was in the kitchen looking through an old photo album. I joined her. There were all kinds of photographs of her family growing up. And mine too. After a while, we were both crying. She said, maybe this is not a very good idea. No. We must come to terms with what is lost. I hugged her and kissed her deeply, in a friendly way. We looked at the memories again. Then they went up to bed. We slept together, but there was no sex. On Monday morning, we went to see a lawyer. Millie Stanton didn't feel comfortable talking to both of us at once. But we insisted. She was a large woman in her fifties with a big 50s-style hairdo. Gray hair, but a non-serious attitude. I liked her, despite her hairstyle. She explained the basics of divorce in the state, and said that adultery is one of the grounds for divorce. But it is now out of favor. However, she said that our situation was beyond the ordinary. We worked out a plan where we would each file for divorce and I would sue Rob for alimony. Millie was not comfortable with Glenda being present, because Rob's finances were tied to hers. Millie said she would file paperwork regarding this, or he could wait to file a lawsuit against Rob until after maternity leave. I asked that Mel be served at work, and at the same time as Rob, this was supposed to happen on Wednesday. I took Glenda to her bank to try to separate their assets. 
This took a while and we had a late lunch at Bersoni's Italian restaurant. We returned to her house at four. I decided to go home to my place. And she went with me. Nobody bothered with the new locks. We went inside. She looked around again, saw what had been familiar to her for many years. I turned around and she stood next to me with the same look. She said, I want you to fuck me on her bed. Now. Please. I could only fulfill such a sincere request. I just picked her up and carried her upstairs. Threw her onto the large bed in the master bedroom. She was laughing. She said, you're so rude and strong. There's no way Rob could do that. She stood up and undressed. Just like me. Naked. We collapsed back onto the bed. Then everything went slowly. At first it was strange for me. Sex with another woman in this bed. But I quickly got over it. She was just a banshee. And she just took what she wanted. At the end, she had such a strong climax that she lost consciousness. And I almost fainted too, when I reached the peak. After that, we lay down. Some time passed and she said, it was so great. Take this bitch's husband on her own bed. It couldn't be better. I smiled and said, how vindictive you are. Yes, and everything is to your advantage. Well, mostly to mine. But you liked it too? Of course I liked it. We reached a climax in revenge sex. Now she laughed. Yeah. From there, everything went downhill. But it was not inclined at all. We had sex all night. Until we stopped in the morning before work. I made love to her. Tender love. After the shower, she cried and so did I. But we got dressed and went to work. Glenda took one of Mel's work outfits. I figured it was more out of revenge. It was a little tight at the top. Mel called me at work, said I need to go into the house to get my things. I came to work in a dirty dress. I can meet you at the house at six. Has Rob been released from the hospital? No. He will have surgery. You fucked him. Great. Where are you staying? At your mother's house. I'm in your old room. Ironic. Where are you and that bitch staying? Here and there. You must rent out one of the houses. What happens when Rob comes out? Not my problem. Have you heard anything about children? No. What have you done? I emailed them a report of what happened and talked to them on the phone. Oh, Tim. They'll hate me. They didn't call me. None of them. You know that you deserve. Fuck you. She shouted. I passed out. I met Mel at the house at six. She arrived on time. An amazing development. She got out of the car and I unlocked the door. She went upstairs. There was a scream. You had her on my bed. I smell. I can't believe you did this. I came up and said she wanted to do it. Revenge for taking her husband away in my opinion, this is not enough. Mel's rage seeped out of her. She gathered her clothes and I helped her carry them downstairs. She had a bag for toiletries. When she loaded up, not noticing that the clothes Glenda was wearing were missing, she asked me, is there any chance that we can? No. None. I meant every word I said. Mel, it's all over between us. She looked depressed, but not surprised. She said, at first, I really wanted to have a good family. Like any wife, this seemed like the best solution. But then everything went off the rail. I apologize for this. I do not accept these apologies. There is nothing you can do to make up for the fact that you had children with another guy and cheated on me for many years. An apology doesn't come close. And I don't believe you're sorry. 
she got into the car and drove away. The next day, she was served at work. Glenda attended to Rob at the hospital. After lunch, my mother called. She said, Tim, did you? Did you have to be in such a hurry with the papers? If you cool down, maybe everything will get better. Nothing like that, Mom. She's been having sex with Rob all these years. Tim! No need for Tim, Mom. And remember who started all this shit. Oh, I remember. Until last week, everything was working fine. I said goodbye. He haven't decided what to do with it yet. After all, she was the one who caused all of this. Save us from well-wishers. Rob was released from the hospital on Friday. He couldn't go back to his home because Glenda would have killed him with his own gun. He ended up at our mother's house, and Mel was there too. I didn't care at all that they were continuing, even if it was in my old room or his. But if my mother allows them to do this, she is dead to me. I discussed this with Glenda. She and I decided to figure out what was what. I still had the key to the house. We waited until two o'clock in the morning. I drove us there, used the key to open the back door. I had a pistol with me in case of an attack. Glenda waited downstairs while I crept up and looked into my old room. I figured they would be there because there was a double bed. She wasn't in Rob's room. They were both there. I had my phone ready and turned on the light to take some pictures. There were screams, mostly from Mel. She was naked. Rob was also naked, but had a large bandage around his lower ribs. He couldn't move normally. Mel simply pulled the blanket over. Her. Mom was running down the corridor and saw me. She said, Tim, don't make hasty conclusions. I said, I don't. No need. You condone what they did. Something they still do. I turned and went downstairs. Glenda was waiting for me there. She said, I guess they were together. Yeah. Go! Mom and Mel came running. Mel was wearing a robe. Bad boy. Rob was nowhere to be seen. Mom said, they are adults. What can I do? Throw them out onto the street? This is my old bed. I think Rob's goal is to fuck her wherever I was. Mel replied, he didn't have me. Could not you hurt him? I laughed at her. Although you probably, huh? And what? I don't stand a chance with you. Is it true? I hope you both rotten. Hell! I turned to my mother. I'm done with you. I'm still your son, but no more. Now you have him, not me. Glenda and I left. We returned to her home. We went to bed at four o'clock. Glenda and I stayed together while the divorces were going through the courts. Mel and I sold the house and split the money. She didn't receive any alimony or anything else from me. The judge didn't like what she did. My children have adjusted. The older two had no contact with Mel other than sending a Christmas card. They blocked her calls. We'll talk to her, but wasn't very condescending when it was time for him to spend the summer. Between years, he stayed with me. He had no contact with Rob. Mel met him for lunch several times. But Rob was not with her. Will didn't want to talk to him. Glenda got almost everything. She kept the house and received a large lump sum for her share of Rob's business. Rob lived in a two-bedroom apartment near his work with Mel. About a week after the divorce, Glenda and I spoke. Our sexual passion remained undiminished. But other than that, we weren't truly compatible. That's why I moved out. Neither of us were particularly sad. I think we knew almost from the beginning that what we had couldn't last. There was too much water under the bridge. She made me promise to come over and have sex with her from time to time. As long as she didn't get into another relationship or me. 
I agreed. She was sexy and we were so good at it. I had an operation which successfully solved my problem. At 49, I was no longer sterile. There's a lot of good in it. That's what I think. One evening at the gym where Ned and I went to practice self-defense, I saw a woman kicking a heavy bag. She was a savage, and she looked fantastic. After she finished, she looked back at me and asked, Scared? He smiled, of course, and stepped back, raising his hands in a sign of surrender. She laughed. I was watching you. You're not afraid of me? I answered. Not afraid? No. I am Hilda Marks. And you? Tim. Tim Miller. I'm going to take a shower and drink coffee. She gestured to the store across the street. I said, meet me there in ten minutes. Let it be fifteen. I'm a woman, after all. Without a doubt. We had a pleasant conversation. She was new. She was 36. She had a school-age son. No husband. She left him on the West Coast. We spent almost two hours talking. By the time the store closed, she knew everything about me, medical history, and everything else. I was fascinated and she was interested in my. At that time, I had a bungalow a mile from the gym. Two bedrooms. Two weeks passed before she visited my bed, and she stayed the night. She was just as wild in bed as she was in the gym. But I was stronger. And she didn't want to win. I wanted to be conquered. I found it a real aphrodisiac. Her son's name is Donald. He was 16. He was in the penultimate grade. He and I got along well because he was a baseball player and so was I. I ended up helping out on the school team. Six months after we met, Hilda and I got married. She was pregnant. Marriage by chance. Donald and she moved into the house I bought next to my old one. He has his own room and there is room in the basement for sports equipment. So his mother can continue to be deadly. Soon Thomas Timothy Miller appeared for me. He became a miracle. Mel and Rob were soon history. She changed agencies. I got together with a plumber. He was younger than her 40 years. I think she's still sexy. Glenda married the guy she dated in college, James Wilder. Hilda and I talked with them a little. He seemed like a good guy. I can confirm that Glenda still looks good. I guess she's still sexy in bed. James and I were talking about this one day. It was a kind of bonding moment. I have never fully forgiven my mother, but he visited her when Thomas was born. She was delighted. Hilda made sure that his mother saw him regularly. She sympathized with her a little more than I did. My mother died in June of this year. The memorial service was calm, despite our family history. Rob said goodbye. I'm not. He kept his distance from me. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you. And go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.